We're in the midst of a remarkable time in our public discourse. It's a bit scary, a bit disconcerting, and it's left a lot of us asking where it's going to all end up. A couple examples. Significant proportions of the population maintain beliefs counter to the scientific consensus on critical issues like vaccination and global warming. <clears throat> Fake news has exploded. Why? Because it's so easy to dupe people, even about outlandish things like Hillary Clinton-related satanic cults operating out of pizza joints. And believe it or not, there's actually a healthy movement of people who maintain, in all seriousness, that the Earth is flat the Flat Earth Society. In fact, a few weeks ago, there was actually a front page story in my hometown paper, the Denver Post, about the local chapter's attempts to secure a billboard in downtown Denver. Now, some of these examples are a little bit out there, but there's a related phenomenon, which is something that we're all guilty of, and that's maintaining beliefs about issues that we don't really understand in depth. So here's just one of my favorite examples. This comes from a study a few years ago at Oklahoma State University. They asked people um, about their attitudes about labeling of foods made with GMO products. And most of the people in their study were in favor of it. But then they asked them another question, whether they approved of labeling food that contains DNA. And people were perfectly happy to agree with that as well. Pretty crazy. Now, I wasn't that surprised by this result. When we run studies on this, we find that people know almost nothing about genetic engineering, not to mention the business or economic implications of labeling foods. And yet they're perfectly happy to voice their opinions on it. Now, this is kind of a funny example, but it reflects a deep truth about the way that we get to our positions. If you look across the board at any important issue that we grapple with, from healthcare to foreign trade to foreign affairs, um, people have a tendency to have strong opinions about these things, despite not knowing very much about them and not understanding them in any, any depth. Bertrand Russell said it very eloquently when he said that the opinions that are held with passion are always those for which no good ground exists. Now, I'm a cognitive scientist. I study the mind. How do we arrive at our beliefs? How do we make sense of the world? How do we store knowledge? Together with Steve Sloman, I wrote a book called The Knowledge Illusion. And one of the major goals of the book is to try to bring some sense, make some sense of this apparent craziness. I personally find these issues to be extremely puzzling. Society, in many ways, is more sophisticated than ever. Science and technology are advancing at remarkable rates. And yet, if you look at people's foundational and bedrock beliefs about the world, they can be so stubbornly resistant to truth. How is that possible? At the same time, our intuitions about this are really poor. So normally when we see these kinds of effects, we just chalk it all up to stupidity. Oh, those people are idiots. But I think that, the, that that explanation is simplistic. It doesn't really do justice to the nuances of these issues. So I think that understanding these issues is really the most important challenge for behavioral science in the 21st century. In a short talk like this, I can't do justice to the complexity and depth of these issues. So what I'll try to do is give you guys a little taste of what we think are some of the underlying cognitions that support these phenomena, some of the most important points. Now, the starting point for our research was some puzzling data from psychology that came out of the lab of a psychologist named Frank Kyle at Yale in the 1990s. Kyle was interested in understanding what do we know about sort of common household everyday objects? And what do we think we know? So for instance, something like this, a toilet. Now you guys can actually do the experiment on yourselves while we sit here, okay? First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you, how well do you understand how a toilet works? Now, if you're like most people, I don't want you to think too hard about it, just give me your first impression. 
if you're like most people, you sort of nod your head and say, yeah, I have a decent sense. I kind of know how a toilet works. But now here's the trick. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, explain it precisely. I want you to step through all of the parts of the mechanism. Explain it to me exactly. And that's what Kyle did. And when he asked his subjects to explain, what do you think happened? Well, this is what happened. <laughs> Turns out, people reach inside to try to explain, and they realize they have just about nothing to say. There's nothing there. We just know remarkably little about the way that the world works, and yet, we feel like we understand a lot of the times, much more deeply when we, than we do. And that's what we call the knowledge illusion. Here's another great example. Bicycles, we all ride them all the time. Obviously, we know a little bit about how they work, right? This is a correct schematic of a bicycle. In 2006, um, a psychologist named Rebecca Lawson gave people a really easy task. She gave them a drawing that kind of looks like this, but it was missing a couple of the pieces. It was missing the chain and the pedals and parts of the frame. And she just said, draw in those uh, parts for me. Should be pretty easy, right? Like, we all ride bicycles all the time. Well, it turns out, that people have no clue where the parts of a bicycle go, despite using one all the time. This task is much harder than it seems like it should be. Here are some of the attempts. It's, it's pretty crazy. I still can't do this. I ride my bike every day. Um, there was actually an Italian artist a few months ago who independently discovered this phenomenon when he realized that his friends couldn't draw a bike. And he actually turned it into an art installation, so he had his friends draw the bikes, and he mounted them in this very beautiful way. But then he took it a step further, and he actually made the bikes. <laughs> and this is um, a bike that would be ridden by M.C. Escher, probably. Um, it wouldn't work at all. So the reason that this was the starting point for an entire book, and why we think that this stuff is so important, is because it's not about bicycles and toilets. It's a fundamental and deep truth about the way that the mind works. And it ends up relating to many of the most important issues we grapple with. So a couple years ago, we ran a series of studies where we wanted to test whether the knowledge illusion contributes to people's political attitudes. So what we did was we asked people uh, about their opinions and attitudes about some of the hot button issues of the time, things like flat tax or cap and trade, sanctions on Iran, and then we asked them to explain. And what we found over and over again was the illusion. People started off with pretty strong opinions and feeling like they understood these issues pretty well. When asked to explain, just like with the toilet, they realized they had very, very little to say. And in fact, they backed off those strong opinions a little bit. Let me tell you about one of the studies in a little more detail. This is a study where we ask people about their attitudes about some of those issues. And then we actually ask them to generate reasons why they believe what they do. And then we ask them whether they wanted to donate to an advocacy group that advocates in favor of their position. And the result is exactly what you would expect. So people who were initially more extreme were more likely to donate. That makes perfect sense we got a very, very different result when instead of asking people for reasons, we asked them to explain the mechanism. Now extremity no longer predicted likelihood of donation. What happened? The people who were initially very extreme in their positions tried to explain and failed. They realized they didn't really know what they were talking about and they backed off those strong positions. They were therefore no longer to donate. That's the knowledge illusion. Now, that didn't happen when they generated reasons. It's just too easy to come up with reasons for your position without actually grappling with the gaps in your understanding. Now, one reaction that people might have when they see results like this is to feel exasperated or embarrassed. How can we be so ignorant? How do we know so little? We really need to educate ourselves better. But it actually turns out that human beings are just not designed to store a lot of detailed information. 
were not storage devices. There was this amazing study that was run by a psychologist named Thomas Landauer in the 1980s, and his goal was to estimate the size of an individual's knowledge base in bytes, the same scale that you'd use to measure a computer's memory. And he did this in a variety of different ways. One of the ways he did it was he analyzed the results of memory experiments where people will um, study some pictures or words or bits of text, and then later they're tested to see if they recognize those things. And then using the data, he was able to estimate the rate at which we can acquire knowledge and also the rate that we forget what we learn. And then he just extrapolated out to a 70-year lifespan. And so what was the estimate that he got to? How much do you know? The answer might surprise you, one gigabyte. I think that this is just a mind-blowing, shocking result. One gigabyte's a tiny amount. By comparison, a thumb drive can hold like 64 gigabytes. Human beings are just not storage devices. Now, this actually makes a lot of sense. The world is just dramatically complex. There is just way too much to know. If as individuals we tried to master all of that complexity, we would fail. It would be impossible. It turns out that what really makes human beings unique and special, what is really the secret to our mastery of the world, is not individual cognition. It's not individuals' ability to know a lot of stuff or process a lot of information. In fact, what it is is our ability to collaborate in communities. Our ability to share knowledge such that individuals don't have to know so much because the group can know a lot. I'm going to show you guys quickly a video that comes from work by uh, Michael Tomasello, a comparative psychologist. He studies human children's cognitive abilities in comparison to other animals like chimpanzees. With the goal of understanding what really makes us special, what is it that we uniquely can do that other animals can't? This is really cute. Yeah, he even makes eye contact at the end. The point of the video is that that little child immediately reads the mind of the experimenter there and figures out how to coordinate his behavior in order to achieve the goal. This is something that humans are uniquely capable at. No other animals can engage in that kind of behavior. And when we see that, it looks so easy and natural to us that it just looks like nothing. But there's actually an incredible amount of cognitive machinery that's required to engage in this kind of collaborative cognition. It's something that no other animal can do. It's really the secret to our success. And what it allows is for us as individuals to be relatively ignorant. We each have our own little slice of expertise, and we don't really know that much about the rest of it. And yet our minds are designed so that we can collaborate in groups and pursue arbitrarily complex goals. That's what allows us to accomplish most of what we accomplish. So now, when we bring this back to policy, what are the implications? Well, the implication is, when you state an attitude about a policy issue, what you're not doing is reflecting knowledge that exists in your own head. Unless you're a real expert, most of the time, we just don't know all that much. Instead, what we're doing is we're reflecting knowledge that's distributed across our community in the experts in our community. The knowledge is shared. It doesn't exist in our heads. And the problem is that we do this so naturally that we often fail to realize that we're doing it. We think the knowledge is in our own head when in fact it's distributed out there in our community. And that really is the source of the knowledge illusion. By virtue of participating in this community where we have access to the knowledge, where it's out there, it makes us feel like we understand a lot better than we do. Now, this creates a really challenging dynamic when it comes to people's beliefs. We all want to understand how can it be that people believe things that aren't true and why are their beliefs so resistant to change? How come giving people more information or explaining to them that they're wrong is so ineffective? Well, it's ineffective 
because their beliefs are not based on knowledge in the first place. And in fact, their beliefs are not something that they can just take and discard at will. They're wrapped up with their entire worldview and with their identity as a member in that community. And moreover, because of this knowledge illusion, we think we've got it all figured out. We very rarely engage in the reflection or deliberation to appreciate that our beliefs are actually in need of revision. The world seems simple when in fact it's incredibly complex. That's a very hard situation. So I want to end my talk by giving you guys a few ideas about some of the um, things that come out of our research that actually suggest we might be able to promote more beneficial discourse. Now I'm going to start by disappointing you a little and saying that these are extremely deep issues, deep problems that are just fundamental to the way that the mind works. And there is no simple silver bullet to solving these issues. However, there are a few things that we can do to open people's minds. The first idea comes from the work, work like the study I showed you earlier. When we attempt to explain, it reveals complexity. And we have to grapple with the gaps in our understanding. And that has the effect of opening people's minds, getting them to move off extreme positions because they feel like they're not on firm ground. We also find that that doesn't happen when we generate reasons. It's just too easy to come up with reasons for your positions without actually grappling with your ignorance. Therefore, discourse that focuses on explanation relative to advocacy tends to lead to more open-mindedness and less ex extremity of belief. The second idea comes from some exciting new work that we're doing right now, and I don't have time to tell you guys in detail about the studies. I'll just give you a little taste of the idea. So often, an issue can be framed in one of two ways. In terms of a fundamental value, this is fundamentally right or wrong. Or in terms of the consequences that would arise if we enacted the policy. We're often encouraged to talk about our values. But we find in our research that when an issue is framed in terms of values, it makes the issue feel really relatively simple. And it also makes the issue feel very black and white, like the two sides are extremely far apart. In contrast, when we talk about consequences, it has a similar effect to trying to explain mechanisms. It reveals complexity. And sometimes when we engage in that exercise, we appreciate that in fact, resolution between these two sides is not quite as intractable as, as it might have seemed on first blush. And finally, Intellectual humility. It's really easy to notice when somebody else doesn't know what they're talking about. When their position is on a shaky foundation and they do not understand the issue in depth. It's much, much harder to recognize that limitation in ourselves. But we're all guilty of it. It's just fundamental to the way that the mind works. Intellectual humility means habitually checking our understanding about, our, about issues and then backing off really extreme positions when we're not on firm ground. And I think that promoting intellectual humility should be an ethos for our time. Thanks. <laughs>